Welcome to Spruce Grove Alliance Church, your home. We are in this series called First Things First. And there's so much that I want to talk about out of the gate, but we got to get some groundwork as we establish this relationship of pastor-congregation. And I'm going to talk about five things over five weeks. We're on week four today. But five things that I am passionate about as a pastor and a follower of Jesus. Five things you're going to hear me reiterate over and over again in the years ahead, we're going to do a whole series on just some of these sermons. And so we've, we've done the, the gospel of grace, the, the power of prayer, the importance of the word, and today we are on spirit-empowered living. Next week we're on collaborative caring community. So this week we're on spirit-empowered living, and I encourage you to buckle up because I believe that the Holy Spirit today is going to move powerfully in each of your lives, if you will let him. Now, when we talk about this spirit-empowered living, there is so many places that we could go in the scripture, and we will get there in the years to come. But today, I want to go to the prequel to the prequel of the, the Holy Spirit fire that came at Pentecost in Acts. So we're going to back up to another story that involved fire back in the Old Testament, an early story from one of my favorite characters, His name is Moses, because I think this story that we're going to talk about today encapsulates everything that we're talking about in like a real life example, a story. We're going to talk about Moses. I think we all have this sense, this sense of vacancy or this this feeling of inadequacy when it comes to the call of God in our lives, that we don't feel that we have what it takes uh, many years ago, before we had kids, so we're talking like 20 years ago, I've been married 22 years, before we had kids, uh, you, you remember those days when you're like, what, I, what did I do with my time and money back then, right? Uh, well, Erica, uh, like my wife, liked to run, and she still likes to run, but she was m- uh, kind of bigger into it at, at that point, and, and she decided that in order to give herself some motivation, she wanted to join uh, an, an amateur race. We were living in Moncton, New Brunswick at the time. She wanted to join an amateur race, and there was a kind of a circuit that went around the province, and, and so there was one that came to our city uh, on a particular day, and so she, she trained to, towards that. It was a 5K, a 10K, and I think a 20K race, and so she trained and get ready, and we showed up on this Saturday, and it was actually at the, the local Christian university, Crandall University, which uh, w- was in, in the city, which kind of hosted the start and the, and the finish of this race. And so we showed up about an hour and 15 minutes early, you know, to register, get your number, and so she could warm up and stretch and and all that. And uh, we were waiting in this long lineup, and I noticed a friend of mine who actually I ironically had gone to Briarcrest with, who was on the athletic department at that university, he had a clipboard, and people were coming to him, he had a walkie-talkie and a, and, a, and, a, and a truck, and so I was like, okay, this guy's kind of in charge of setting up the race, and he looks a little panicky, people are coming to him, setting up, and he looks at me, and I'm in line, and he says, are you doing anything right now? Like from a distance, like, are you doing anything right now? Can you help me set up a table? And we're like an hour away from the race, and Erica was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, we go, go help. And, you know, because I'm just going to be standing around for an hour anyway. I was there to cheer her on from when she started and when she finished. And, and, and so I jump in the truck. We go down to a, a building, and we fire a whole bunch of tables on this truck. And then we head down the road a couple kilometers, turn left into this subdivision, maybe another kilometer. And we come to this four-way stop. And he lets me out of the truck, and he says, okay, take two or three tables off the truck and set them up right there on the other side of this four-way stop. So easy enough, you know, big, long eight-foot tables that have folding legs. So I took them over there, set them up, and I just sat because he took off, and he was going to set up, obviously, more tables somewhere else. And I'm like, I don't know what this is, but here I am. I'm sitting on the table. A couple, uh, like I'm looking at my watch and we're like about 45 minutes away from the race starting and then 15 minutes pass and then another truck comes by and puts this big Gatorade container of water, another big Gatorade container of Gatorade and this huge thing of cups. And so you're thinking what I'm thinking. 
This is a water station. You've seen this on the Olympics, maybe, or some race if you've watched it on TV. And so I am a little bit biased for action, so I kind of sitting there doing nothing. So I start filling cups and put them all in these nice little rows, Gatorade here, water here. And I'm looking at my watch and time is going. And, and, and I'm like, the race is going to start really soon. Another truck comes by and drops off this paramedic with this big bag and he's there. And I'm here by this table all by myself. And I look at my watch and the race has started. I'm like, well, okay, Lord, you have other plans today. And and uh, maybe I'll get to see my wife ran, run by, and I'm, I'm looking at this four-way stop, this way, this way, this way. I don't know where the rate runners are coming from. And all of a sudden, I see them coming from this direction. So I've seen this on TV. I grab water, and I hold it out. <laughs> and they're running by, and people are, and I can't keep up, and it's splashing all over me. So they're throwing cups everywhere. And this whole blur goes over in like 45 seconds as they all run by. Now, that was awesome. I pick up the cups. And then I sit there, and I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't know. And I'm looking this way, and I'm looking that way. And then all of a sudden, I look where the runners had run about five minutes later, and all of a sudden, they're coming back. And I'm like, obviously, they'd gone up and done a loop, and they were coming back. And, and, and th by this time, there's one clear runner in front of the pack. He's like 200 yards in front of the pack, and this guy looks like he's an Olympian. Like, he runs in his sleep, and he, he, he just given her. And I'm holding a water and Gatorade again, because here we go again. And this guy runs right by me, doesn't take any water or Gatorade. He goes right through the four-way stop, and he stops, and he freezes, and he looks at me, and he goes, which way do I go? <laughs> oh, yeah. And apparently, I didn't have a look on my face that was that, you know, competent. <sighs> And I did some quick math, and it felt like maybe five seconds, but I'm sure it was only like maybe one second where I made him freeze in the middle of the race. And I'm thinking, I got a 33.3% chance of getting this right. <laughs> and the way I pointed, I was like, uh, that way? And he's like, duh! Like, bah. And, 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 and the paramedic goes, I think that's the wrong way. Yeah, th thanks, Monday morning quarterback. Yeah, that, that, was, that was good. And I sent everyone else that way. Still this day, I don't know. I didn't show up at the end of the ceremonies. I didn't want to know. There could be people running around Moncton 20 years later going, that stupid water boy. He didn't know what he was doing. But as he shook his head in disgust and he ran away, I just wanted to scream out, I just agreed to set up a table. I don't know what I'm doing here. Have you ever felt inadequate for the task at hand? Perhaps that you're making it up as you go. I think when it comes to the call of God on our life, that we all have this secret fear. That he's going to place us in this circumstance, place us in this time and place where, where we're not going to have the tools necessary to deal with what he's given us and called us to do. And we're not going to know which way to go. We're going to feel totally inadequate. I, I don't know. Maybe for you, it was when you held your firstborn child. Do you remember that? Remember your very firstborn child? And, and you're like, I, I'm in charge? Like, where's the adult? And, 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 and where's the owner's manual? Like, like if, if I don't care for this thing, it dies. And, then you're, and you feel, like, totally inadequate. And it doesn't end there, right, parents? Like, it's different stages of parenting along the way where you hit different, <laughs> different snarls, and, and, and you're like, I, I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know how to deal with middle school kids. I don't know how to deal with high school kids. I don't need to deal with this empty nest thing. Maybe, maybe for you, it was, it was when, you, when you had this unforeseen, unexpected thing come your way. You had to move, and you have to find all new roads. Maybe, maybe it was an unexpected losing a loved one. And you have, now have to navigate life. And you're like, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to do this. Like for years I've, I've, I've lived with this person and now, and now they're gone. Maybe, maybe God's calling you to a ministry or, or a mission and you just feel like, I, I, I don't know if I have what it takes. I think we all have that sense of inadequacy. We've all been there. But what if I said that one of the super all-star heavyweights of faith in the Old Testament felt the exact same way? My favorite character, 
probably the most uh, popular character in the Old Testament. His name is Moses. Let's set the stage here for a bit for where we get to the scene of the fire in a moment. Moses grew up in a rather hostile environment, to say the least, a convoluted environment. The Pharaoh at the time is the world leader of the day is in Egypt, and he has these Hebrews that keep growing in his kingdom, and they grow to about two million people, and he, and he wants to control them, and so he enslaves them, and they don't stop growing in population, and so he puts out this edict of forced abortions for all male-born babies. So all male-born babies are supposed to be thrown into the Nile River to try and control the population. It didn't control the population. And so Moses is born into this to Hebrew slave parents, and he's supposed to be killed. He's supposed to be thrown into the Nile River. But mom and dad, mom and dad hide him for a while, but every parent knows that you can't hide a crying baby very long before someone starts asking questions. And so it wasn't long before in this this gut-wrenching moment, I can't imagine how this felt where they they built this basket and they put put this baby in a basket and send it out in the Nile because they'd rather just see it drift away than see someone slaughter this child of theirs. And this act of faith and, and the sovereignty of God, if you know the story, it floats into the, to the, to the princess's castle. And the princess finds this baby and pulls this baby up out of water and calls this baby Moses, which means up out of water. And Moses rides grows up with this identity crisis. He knows he's supposed to be a Hebrew slave, should have been killed, but now he's a prince of Egypt. And his whole life, he's just wrestling with this. And, and, and he sees this moment one time where he feels like maybe he can help out his Hebrew people, where he sees an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrew slaves, and he reacts and he attacks the Egyptian, he kills the Egyptian, and he hides the body, and he thinks nobody's seen it. The very few next days later, he's out, and he sees two of his Hebrew friends arguing. He says, oh, stop arguing. You know, there's bigger fish to fry here. And then came that stinging phrase which played itself out over Moses' leadership career over and over again, who made you ruler over us? And Moses runs, because he realizes his people have rejected him, Egypt wants him to kill him. And he runs to the wilderness, this place called Midian, and he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. And he probably thinks he's going to spend the rest of his life just yelling at sheep. This low-end job, like total low in the totem pole. And then one day, the fire happens. (laughs) The infamous, the famous fire Moses sees a bush that is on fire but isn't consumed, it isn't burning, and Moses is drawn to it, and God speaks to him from this fire. Fire represents the presence of God all throughout Exodus and then even in Acts, the fire of God. And God speaks to him, and he calls him to this enormous task, go back to Egypt, talk to Pharaoh, the world leader of the day, tell him to let the people go and bring the people out to worship me on this mountain. And Moses stalls. He feels totally inadequate. He said, you're going to put me in a situation where where I I don't know which way to go. Let's read about it. Right after this burning bush, God says to this, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people up out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose you go to the Israelites, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. We'll talk about that. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders and say to them, 
I repeated that phrase there. But know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless the mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people. So that when you leave, you'll not go empty-handed. Every woman has to ask their neighbor and any, any woman living in her household for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. And Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me or say, and, and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And so Moses reached out and took the snake and turned into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. Oh, there we go. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they'll believe the second. But if they do not believe that these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. And so Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord, now go, and I will help you speak and teach you what to say. And I think we all can identify with Moses here. Have you ever heard of this hockey player? His name is John Scott. He's a good Edmonton boy, actually. In 2016, the NHL All-Star Game ratings were plummeting. Nobody was watching the NHL All-Star Game. They didn't want to watch a bunch of millionaires just do a half-hearted effort on the ice and just goof off for a while. And so in order to inspire engagement with the fan base and audience, they, in 2016, they introduced something brand new, fan-based voting. So you could vote on who, what all-stars you wanted to see in the NHL all-star game. You guys could vote. Anyway, everyone even could vote. Well, uh, just to show that the fans had disdain for this game called the All-Star Game, a few people on social media found this kind of no-name, nothing player named John Scott. He was like up and down from the minors. He only had like one assist in the major leagues, and he played for the Coyotes at the time. And they pushed him on social media. Let's get this guy in the NHL All-Star Game. And if you remember this, this was just a few years ago, Sure enough, they voted, and much to the NHL's chagrin, he got in. And he, uh, he was named the captain of the Pacific team. He was named MVP. His helmet is in the Hall of Fame. Whenever he would touch the puck in this NHL All-Star game, the place kind of would erupt. He scored two goals, and I think they're even going to make a movie about this. And the NHL changed the rules the next year so this wouldn't happen. But they're interviewing this guy, and here he is. They lift him, all of them, the great players, lift him up and hold him up at the end of the game as if he's the MVP. But they interviewed him and they said, what do you think about this? And he's like, I'm just happy to be here. I mean, I don't care what convoluted circumstance brought me to this place. I'm just glad I'm playing with like some of the best players in the world. John Scott embraced this moment. Moses does the opposite. There's this phrase, you probably heard it repeat over and over and again that God said to Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. There's four times the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And I'm sure every time that he said that phrase, deep down Moses just shuddered. These, these are all stars of the people of God, Abraham. Who God used in powerful ways, Isaac and Jacob. And Moses is probably like, you're putting me in the same sentence as those guys? I don't think so. Who am I? You're putting me in the same locker room as Ovechkin and Crosby and McDavid? No, 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 no. I just play gentleman's league. And so Moses stalls. 
And often we can have that same paralyzing fear when it comes to embracing the call of God. Who am I? Who am I, God, to do that? You know, one of the things that I love about the story of God that you're going to hear over and over and over again is that, is that God uses the B team, the C team, the D team, the Z team to do amazing things for him. Which is what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians. God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things to shame the strong, the lowly things and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. That's the story of the Bible. I mean, we could track that all through the characters that God used. They're all like, who am I? Who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the same locker room of, of Ovechkin and Crosby and McDavid. No way. But God uses them in powerful ways. So if you feel this morning inadequate, you're in good company. Because the rest of the all-stars in the Bible felt the exact same way. Well, Moses had four objections. Who am I? Verse 11. And then he asked God, who are you? And then there's this outward fear, and then there's this inward fear. There's this outward insecurity, and there's this inward insecurity. What about them? People aren't going to take me seriously. And what about my issue? I stutter. It literally translates, I'm, I'm slow of mouth and tongue. And those, those two are the most crippling things. Like, what are people going to think of me? And, and, I, and, and I know me better than me, and, and I have issues, and I'm not the greatest public speaker. I mean, I think Jerry Seinfeld said once, we'd rather be the subject of a funeral there rather than speak at one. <laughs> it's like, though, that God knew that Moses would bring up these hesitations, and he introduces an image of himself for the very first time in the Bible. The most popular, shall I say, anthropomorphic image. Anthropomorphism, you know what that means? is giving human characteristics to something that's not. Disney does it all the time. Give it to animals. God did it first. <laughs> God is spirit. He just doesn't have a body, and I know he came in the flesh in Jesus, but he doesn't, doesn't, and he doesn't have eyes and hands and feet, but the Bible gives that to them so it helps us understand and brings them down to our level. And this is the very first anthropomorphic and the most common anthropomorphic image of God in the Bible. It's this mighty hand will stretch out and help you. You want to do an interesting Study sometime, track that phrase with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. We sing it in songs. It's all throughout the prophets. It's like eight times in the book of Deuteronomy. It's in the Psalms with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And the hand of God in the Bible, the mighty hand and an outstretched arm, is always outstretched and working on behalf of his people. I don't know if you've seen uh, the Mr. Universe competition. Arnold Schwarzenegger is probably the most famous Mr. Universe. I don't know who gets to name, claim that title other than God himself. But anyway, someone said, you're Mr. Universe. And it's these guys on stage that have abnormally large muscles like mine. And <laughs> they can't fit through a doorway without going sideways. And they butter themselves up and they flex for everyone to look. And they go, wow, that looks not human. <laughs> right? Sorry if you're into that. <laughs> and it's, it's muscle for show on stage. But it's not very pragmatic muscle. But if you've seen the World Strongman competition, that's like pragmatic farm boy. Strong, like these guys are pulling transport trucks. They're flipping over tractor tires. Like the whole length of a, of a football field, they're lifting these massive boulders, a whole football field. I mean, that's pragmatic muscle. And, 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 and the arm of God, the strong arm of God in the Bible is not muscle for show. Look at me in heaven and I'm, I'm big and flexy. And it, it's pragmatic. It's, it's, it's a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It's moving and working on behalf of its people. And that's an image we can all understand because God's up there, right? And his hand is reaching down. And you track that phrase with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It's always in conjunction with the Exodus of when God used Moses the plagues in Egypt 
take them out into the wilderness through the Red Sea. I mean, oh my goodness, that's mighty hand and outstretched arm. Through that provision in the wilderness of quail and manna and then into the promised land to defeat his enemies. That's the mighty hand and an outstretched arm of God. And look at how this mighty hand and an outstretched arm is first going to play itself out in the people. Ladies, you might like this. Anyone like shopping? I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people. And when you leave, you're not leaving every woman has asked their neighbor for silver, gold, and clothing. Jewelry and clothes, ladies. It's what every mall has. I hate shopping. <laughs> you're going to go ask them. And, and, and they are going to give you everything. The first image of this mighty hand and an outstretched arm is a God of resource provision for his people. Do you trust that? Do you know that? Do you know that mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or is your picture of God, he's just up there flexing? Do you know the mighty hand and the outstretched arm in your life with the call of God? But not only is it for the people of God, it's for Moses. Moses' big hesitations on the outside and the inside are like, these people aren't going to take me seriously. And what about my issue? And he gives Moses the ability to perform these signs. The staff, the snake, the leprous hand, the, the Nile, the blood, were all visual images that, that, that God gave a prophet so that people would know that God's hand rested upon them. And he gives Aaron, you know the story, you didn't read it, but he, he gives Aaron as this, as this guy who's going to speak for him, but Aaron doesn't ever actually speak much. Moses ends up doing it. The strong hand of God is upon his life. God provides for Moses, not just physically, but spiritually. But the largest answer to all of Moses' inadequacy is found in the name of God. I am that I am. Now, we'll talk about names in the years to come, but names are, are very significant in the Bible, okay? Uh, when, when, when God would, would, would uh, change the direction of somebody's life, he would often change their name, like Abram, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, uh, uh, Jacob, Israel, Saul, Paul, and there, there's a few examples. Or if God was going to do something significant and move in a new way in the world, he would tell a prophet or a man of God to name their child a specific name. You see this with Hosea, you see this with Isaiah, Jesus, Name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In the name of Jesus means God saves. So when God was going to do something significant, he would give a name. And so Moses knows the name of God. He knows the name of Yahweh even before this. So Moses isn't asking, tell me your name for the very first time. He is asking God, what does your name mean in circumstances like this? What message do you have for me and the people of God where your people haven't heard from you for 40 years? And he says, I am that I am. That he is the self-existing one, the sovereign, self-existing one, not dependent upon anyone else. And right in front of Moses is this visible illustration of this, of this fire that burns but does not consume this bush. I was at the junior high fire last Friday, a couple days ago. Trevor lit a big inferno on this tinder dry pile of brush and it just went right fire consumes things this fire had eternal resources that were not from this world he's the self-existing one not dependent upon anyone else he's the great i am i grew up in in nova scotia and just about 15 minutes down the road from where I grew up, there was this place called the Oaklawn Farm Zoo. And it's just this run-of-the-mill zoo, mom-and-pop shop. You pay 10 bucks to get in. But this place, I'm telling you, could rival everything that's in the Calgary Zoo or even the San Diego Zoo. Like, it had, it wasn't as well kept, but it had animals from all over the world. And I, I kid you not, up until years ago, a few years ago, the, the largest attraction in this zoo was the lions. 
And this little tiny zoo in the middle of nowhere, Nova Scotia, Oakland Farm Zoo, had the largest lion in captivity in the world. His name was Rutledge. He died a few years ago. 807 pounds. And I guess lions are, are, are larger in captivity than they are in the wild because they eat better. So this very much at the time, we used to go there almost every summer, take our families and go. We would go see these, these lions, 870 pounds. 807 pounds of king of the jungle beast. I mean, you could go to the zoo and you could go well, look at the monkeys and you could look at the, look at the deer and, and, and look at the bears and, and, and that's fine. But, but man, I always loved to go and just get as close as I could to this lion's cage. It was this huge cage, probably the size of our parking lot outside. This double fenced area. And, and in the evening, they were always the most active because that was feeding time. And there's just something, it's, it's like a spiritual moment for me where you're in something, in the presence of something so powerful as this thing just walks back and forth on the other side of this fence just looking at you, knowing full well that that fence was not there, that you'd be its next meal. I don't know if you've heard a, a lion purr. It'll make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, like that close. I I don't know if you've heard a lion roar. I have friends who lived two kilometers away from that zoo, and they said that they could hear feeding time every single night because of the roars. It will shake every bone in your body. And Moses stands in the presence of Almighty God. And he knows his name. And if his name is I am, Moses in that moment, he must recognize that my name is I am not. And that's an important thing because he's going to Pharaoh, Pharaoh who thinks he is God. Moses, are you going to take the people out of Egypt? No, I'm not. Moses, are you really going to take them out of here and send all the plagues? No, I am not, but I am. He's got something coming for you. I once went to this youth pastor, youth specialties conference in Pittsburgh many years ago when I was a youth pastor, and for the first time I heard one of my favorite speakers speak. I didn't know who he was at the time, but he spoke at this conference. His name was Louis Giglio. Maybe you've heard of him. Um... And he spoke on this passage, and he had this amazing phrase that kind of encapsulates how we're supposed to live this. So I'll give him the credit for it. But it's this phrase called, I am not, but I know I am. Yeah, it's a play on words. It's not just the power of positive thinking, but it's, I know in my heart that I am not, but I know it within me is the great I am. Fourteen times in this passage, God promises to be with Moses. Fourteen times. And in the Old Testament, God promised that he was going to be with someone. But in the New Testament, God's withness turns to God within us. In the New Testament. And right in front of Moses' face is this visual illustration of what he is going to become for Pharaoh and the people of God. This fire that burns a bush, an ordinary bush, that isn't consumed. This normal, ordinary thing that's going to be used in extraordinary ways. This natural thing that's going to be used in a very supernatural way that has eternal resources that are not from this world. And you see that in the story of Moses when he goes on from here, and we don't have time to get into it, that he becomes this burning bush, this ordinary, natural, run-of-the-mill, nothing thing that God uses in extraordinary ways. Do you know that fire on the inside of your life? Do you know that Holy Spirit on the inside? You know, sometimes I feel that we don't 
recognize or realize the Christ in you, the hope of glory, the, the Holy Spirit power that Paul talks about in Ephesians, the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives inside of you. We don't understand these eternal resources. Mercy Me is one of my favorite Christian bands. They sing a song called Say I Won't. Say that I won't do whatever, you know, the call of God in my life. And the, the essence of the song is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It, the song starts by saying this. Today, it all begins seeing my life for the very first time through a different lens. Yesterday, I didn't understand driving 35 with a rocket inside. I didn't know what I had. And he goes on to say that, say that I won't, but the spirit inside says I'm so much more. And I think sometimes as believers, we have this rocket on the inside that we haven't lit. We don't understand what it means to have the Holy Spirit, the God, the great I am living inside of us, to live this phrase, I am not, but I know I am. When you do grasp it, there's this tremendous freedom. There's this tremendous peace. There's this tremendous rest and intimacy when we embrace this Holy Spirit fire on the inside. Who has ever felt like this before? Who could be smart enough to figure this out? Hmm? I am. If I don't do it, who will? I am. Nobody's listening to me. I am. Everything's changing. What is constant? I am. Who can I trust? I am. What will others think? I am. Who's going to want me after this? I am. I've given it all, but it's never enough. I am. I can't hold it together anymore. I am. I'm done. I am. Somebody just hold me. I am. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the Savior. I'm the Redeemer. I'm the solution. I'm the restorer. I'm the builder, I'm the healer, I'm the answer, I'm the provider, I'm the all-present one, I'm the all-powerful one, I'm the all-knowing one, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the living one, I'm the true vine, I'm the mighty one, I'm the wise one, I'm the eternal one, I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, I'm the coming one, I'm the Lord. I am the Holy Spirit inside of you. Amen. We're driving 35 with a rocket inside. I didn't know what I had. My prayer for Bruce Grove Alliance Church is that we would individually and collectively light that I am rocket on the inside and hold on <laughs> and let God do his thing. Thanks for listening to this week's message from Spruce Grove Alliance Church. For more information or to hear past messages, please visit sgac.net.